Coming up on Chopper's Politics. I think unionists have not to be frightened about making an emotional case for the United Kingdom, a heart case as well as a head case. It's a first birthday we'd rather forget. What a time we live in. It was a week that the coronavirus shut down the UK with millions of us confined to our homes to stop the spread of COVID-19. So, like you, I'm socially distancing. But the wonders of the internet mean that we can bring you half an hour every week, wherever you are, of the best of Chopper's politics. Yes, this week saw the coronavirus lockdown blow out the candle on its birthday cake, and what a year. So it would be remiss of us not to talk about coronavirus in some form on this podcast. And later on, We'll be talking about the big news this week. The EU and UK spat over the AstraZeneca vaccine with Stephanie Bolton, London editor of the German paper Die Welt. Plus, on the week that saw violent protests in Bristol in opposition to the new police crime sentencing and courts bill, we'll hear from former Attorney General Sir Geoffrey Cox on why he thinks the bill is justified but might need some small tweaks. But first, Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister, faced a vote of no confidence this week after a Holyrood committee found she had misled Parliament over a handling of the Alex Salmon case. The result of the vote on motion 24292 in the name of Ruth Davidson is yes 31, no 65. There were 27 abstentions and the motion is therefore not agreed. That was only the sixth no confidence vote and the first involving a serving First Minister in the 22-year history of the devolved parliament. And I should know, because I was there at the beginning in Scotland, working for the Scotsman newspaper back in 1999. It's the latest development in the row between two of Scotland's most prominent political players, Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond. After the first minister was cleared of breaching the ministerial code during the Scottish government's botched handling of sexual harassment claims against her predecessor, Mr Salmond. And we must point out that Mr. Salmon denied wrongdoing and has since been acquitted at trial. So what will be the long lasting implications for Nicola Sturgeon in this affair, especially so close to the elections on May the 6th? I thought I'd call on an old friend of this programme and an expert in all matters Scottish, former Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell. David Mundell, if you look at the results this week for Nicola Sturgeon, it's basically an, an away win on away goals. One all score draw. She lost the Holyrood Committee, but she won the James Hamilton report, and that was seen to be have more importance. So she won on away goals. What do you think? Well, that's not my analysis. What I think is that Nicola Sturgeon is just picking and choosing the bits of the various inquiries and reports that suit her and then spinning that uh, as if she's been completely vindicated. That's not the case. Even the Hamilton report, which said that that there wasn't a a breach of the ministerial code based on taking her word for it, that she had forgotten various events, uh, didn't completely vindicate her. It uh, indicated that there were areas in which uh, he hadn't uh, seen all the evidence or documentation. It was clear that it was a matter for the Scottish Parliament to determine whether or not it had been misled. And obviously, the committee that was set up in in relation to some aspects of the Salmon uh, inquiry said that it had been misled and therefore Parliament had been misled. So I I, I think this is very much uh, a case of selective decisions by Nicola Sturgeon that put her in uh, the best light. But there are still many, many questions about this matter to be answered. And that's why along with my Scottish Conservative colleagues, we favour having a judge-led independent inquiry into all the circumstances. Because what's happened here, Chris, is that we've had a number of your bespoke inquiries, but the whole picture has never uh, been properly looked at, right back from the sort of allegations that we heard during the Alex Salmond criminal trial about the way in which the Scottish government was conducted during the past decade through to the circumstances uh, in which the civil court action uh, involving Mr Salmond again was was settled for 
over £500,000 of taxpayers' money without any clear explanation as to why a decision to settle that case was delayed and the costs mounted for the taxpayer. So for me, this is, you know, in terms of getting to the facts, knowing exactly what happened and most importantly, who's responsible, we haven't got uh, the answers that allow us to uh, draw a line under the matter. Blimey, a, a judge-led inquiry might go on for years and years, but but surely, Dave Mundell, shouldn't it be a question of an inquiry by maybe the head of the UK civil service into the running of the Scottish government? I think that the UK civil service uh, does have a, a role, and obviously the Cabinet Secretary of head, as head of that does, because Leslie Evans, who's the permanent secretary uh, in the Scottish government, does report directly to uh, Mr Case in terms of line management. So it, it's very, very important that uh, all those uh, procedures and, and, and processes uh, have fo- been followed. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is taking close notice of what's been going on and the conclusion of the various inquiries. But you know, we need something that actually pulls it all together, not just the, the civil service aspects of it, the, the governmental aspects, the, the political uh, aspects. That's, that's what's gone wrong here, in a sense, is that we've had numerous different uh, inquiries, but we've not had any capacity to pull it all together. And that's what's needed. As at this time, nobody, no politician, no uh, civil servant, nobody has taken responsibility. Not a single person has resigned or left office despite all the things that have been revealed to date. Do you think that might actually help the Conservatives or the Labour Party looking at the May 6th election? The fact that it's, it seems that nothing's happened in terms of this money spent and the way it's spent and and even, you know, it's been admitted by senior SNP politicians that there were some issues there with the way it was spent and the structure of the investigation, etc. Do you think that no one carrying can might help you guys at the next election? Well, I think, you know, that there are two aspects uh, to, to that. I mean, one is obviously the need to hold politicians to account. And ultimately, the people of Scotland will give their verdict on Nicola Sturgeon and her various accounts of Uh, What happened, Mr Hamilton, uh, in his report, gave her the benefit of the doubt in terms of the fact that she'd forgotten certain events. The people of Scotland at the ballot box, you know, might have a different uh, interpretation. So that will be obviously a factor in, in the election. But what's also clear is that Nicola Sturgeon just wants to put all these events behind her so that she can focus on her one true obsession, and that's having another independence referendum. You know, it doesn't matter what's happened over the last few months, years. It just all, as always, comes back to independence. And we had this week in the Scottish Parliament, in the midst of a COVID pandemic, which is not over by any uh, means, we had an independence bill introduced. So I think that uh, as part of the uh, election, you know, people will see that actually that is really all that Nicola Sturgeon is about. It's about bringing about another divisive independence referendum. And I think and hope that the public will see that, you know, the Scottish Conservatives are the people that in this parliament have been willing to stand up to her, to try and hold her to account in relation to the whole uh, Salmond affair, and are the people that will stand up to her in relation to having another independence referendum within months. Just before Christmas, we spoke to expert pollster Deborah Mattinson, and she'd been asking people across the nations what animal they felt best represented party leaders. Nicola Sturgeon was characterised as a tiger by far the most positive response of those polled. Do you think she can hold on to that, that image of being viewed as a tiger, or is her reputation irreversibly damaged? Well... Tigers uh, are, of course, superficially uh, attractive, but they are lethal. And very few people survive an encounter with a tiger. And we've seen in the last uh, week or so, you know, Nicola Sturgeon criticised by a committee of a parliament that she says that she respects and that everybody, everybody in Scotland, everybody in the rest of the UK 
should listen to and, and, and take seriously. When a committee in that parliament dared to uh, give a, a view contrary to hers, I mean, she lashed out in a way that, you know, in a, in a very tiger way, just the claws were really, really out. The members of the committee who had dared to speak out against her were viciously clawed. So the analogy isn't completely wrong. Do you think the Tories and Labour are better off with Nicola Sturgeon staying in office, given what she's got through over the past few weeks? She sees, as you would see, as damaged goods, and that could only help you at the polls. I think that uh, what we wanted was uh, Nicola Sturgeon to stand down. That's why we held a vote of confidence in the Scottish Parliament. The, the Nationalists, the Greens, they were never going to let that uh, happen. That's what should have happened in relation to proper procedure uh, and process. Somebody who has misled Parliament, who has breached the ministerial code, has shown such disrespect towards other members of the Scottish Parliament, I believe Nicola Sturgeon should have stood down. So we just have to deal with the reality of what's happened. She will be carrying on into that election. People, I say, as I said earlier, will have a view in relation to what she has said and done in Parliament over recent weeks, months and years. But I think they will also take into account you know, this underlying obsession uh, with, with separation and having another referendum. What is the uh, strategy, do you think, to, to save the union? We, we hear a lot about the UK government tipping money directly into the pockets of local authorities. Is that going to work? I, I think it's, it's very, very important you know, that we demonstrate to people in Scotland the benefits of, of being in the United Kingdom. And you know, people have to see that Scotland has two governments under the, the devolved system and that you know, both governments are important to Scotland. Both governments are working positively for Scotland. And all the polling that takes place shows that people want to see both governments working constructively together. And when they do work together, that's what really benefits Scotland. So we've seen what the UK government with its you know, fantastic effort in terms of procuring and delivering vaccines. We've seen the Scottish government rolling them out to, to people across Scotland. You know, government's working together, delivering for the for the people of Scotland. And, and that's what we've got to demonstrate. We've got to demonstrate how um, the UK government uh, delivers uh, for Scotland. And I don't think, you know, we haven't necessarily done that as well in the past. I think we were also were complacent in a, in, a, in a way, in the sense that when we signed up the Edinburgh Agreement for the referendum in 2014, that was on the basis... Uh, that this would be a once-in-a-generation event, that both sides would respect the result. Well, we heard uh, this week in Parliament from the SNP that actually the once-in-a-generation pledge was just a con. It was just a, a trick to try and get their own supporters out to vote. There was never any intention for the referendum to be a once-in-a-generation event. It was always going to be just a keeping going until they got the right answer. So we have to make sure, those of us who want Scotland to reign in the United Kingdom, that we are making the case for the, for the United Kingdom on, on the same daily basis as the nationalists make the case for separation. Dave, in terms of, of making that case, do you think more can be done with, with Northern English MPs to make the case for the union? Often the Tory party, particularly less so Labour, are characterised as parties of the south of England. But but really, it's those communities in the north which might have more to do with Scotland and, and, and more and more more common cause. Do you think, think the government should try and look at maybe utilising the, the red wall Tory seats and some Labour, Labour MPs who want to help to see if they can help? I think my new so red wall colleagues are uh, very positive towards keeping you know, the United Kingdom together because many of them have direct connections with Scotland, both from with their constituencies and you know personally. And a, a number of MPs, for example, uh, Peter Gibson, new MP for Darlington, contributed to one of the, the debates this week on Scottish independence, just setting out that very, very point, his own personal connection with Scotland. And it's these connections that are very, very powerful. And I think, you know, it's not just about making the case for the union that uh, your X, Y and Z pounds better off. It's actually 
you know, the togetherness, the way in which families are bound together across the, the whole of the UK, the way in which by sharing and coming together, we create something that, that, that's greater than the sum of the parts. And I, I think unionists have not to be frightened about making an emotional case for the United Kingdom. We've been very, very focused at previously, I think, on the, the facts, which you know, I think in themselves are very, very compelling. But you know, there needs to be an emotional uh, case for the United Kingdom as well, a heart case as well as a head case. <laughs> let's, let's leave head cases out of it, but I know, you, I know what you mean by that exactly. So, Deb Mundell, what more can listeners to this podcast do if they care about the UK to support the government in its attempts to preserve the UK? I think that people can do something by just you know, acknowledging what a great country Britain is together. And, you know, there isn't a Britain without Scotland in it. You know, that we're not going to have a global Britain if there's no Scotland as part of it. It would just be a global England, global England and Wales, or England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland is key to Britain, the continuation uh, of it. I, th I think, you know, people in Scotland are much more aware of that because we've been round the constitutional loop so many times that the difference between Scotland and, and Britain, we don't, you know, sometimes in England people blur that difference. But it, it would be really significant, destabilising, I think, for England if Scotland left. It wouldn't just be a case of, oh, we wouldn't have to send X amount of money uh, north of the border. It would destabilise what has been the most successful political union of the last 300 years. And you know, I, I think people you know, need to recognise that, recognise the, the the negativity that would happen right across the UK if Scotland was to leave, and again themselves not be afraid to embrace you know the emotional case for having the United Kingdom stick together. Dev Mundell, the former Scottish Secretary, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Right, stay with us. Coming up, former Attorney General Sir Geoffrey Cox tells us why he doesn't understand the clamour to kill the bill. Right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal, and it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one, OK? Shut up. <laughs> And we're back. Now, this week saw explosive clashes in Bristol following protests against the police crime sentencing and courts bill. Politicians were quick to condemn the violence, but a criticism of the measures themselves are being more hotly debated. There are suggestions from some corners that the bill is an attempt to quash the great British tradition of protest. But former Attorney General Sir Geoffrey Cox thinks those calls are overblown. In general principle, I see this as a desirable and legitimate steps. There's nothing unreasonable in it, and there has been a good deal of left-wing hysteria. I think much of it, frankly, ignorant. I sometimes wonder if some of the critics of the bill have read it, because the truth is I think it's a perfectly reasonable approach that the government is taking, albeit perhaps not yet perfect. We'll come on to those points shortly. Does it go too far, do you think? It includes an offence of intentionally or recklessly causing public nuisance. We might be thinking about Extinction Rebellion towing a, a boat onto the street around Parliament Square and blocking the traffic. Is that really where, where we want the police to go now? But you see, this is the problem, Chris, because 
such an enormous amount of armchair criticism is made of this bill, but not always on the basis of a great deal of knowledge. There is already an offence of public nuisance. It's a common law offence. Uh, the penalty for it is unlimited, and it includes causing the public discomfort, a, a public nuisance. Now, this was a Law Commission recommendation, which the government has adopted. The Law Commission recommended that the common law offence, which suffers from a potential of vagueness, should be put onto a statutory basis and defined clearly. And that's all that this provision does. The offence already exists, but what it does do is it narrows the offence, requiring intention or recklessness at the moment. That is not required for the common law offence of public nuisance. So what, in fact, the government is doing is narrowing the a scope of an already existing offence. Making it harder to prosecute or to charge. Making it harder to prosecute. And you see what I mean by the extraordinary torrent of misinformation and misconceived criticism from those who I think just haven't either read the bill or who are motivated, I'm afraid, by what are political motives. The characterization of this bill as some sort of attempt to undermine democracy and liberty, I think, is just completely unfair. But that isn't to say it isn't improvable. Who do you blame for this misunderstanding? It's not just journalists making mistakes or, or campaigners. It's MPs too, isn't it? Do you think there's a, in the modern day, that, that we can't really understand the subtleties of these complicated bits of legislation in, in the kind of social media age? Well, I think social media has a lot to do with it. I think the problem is that in an age of whatever it is, 42-odd character Twitter responses, uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to careful and thoughtful analysis. And, and I'm, I just think that we should take a step back. There's been an enormous amount of hysterical criticism of this bill, and I don't say that this bill is unimprovable. I think some of the definitions do need to be tightened. What would you improve then? you said that three times now. Well, what would you improve in this, in this legislation? Well, I think that some of the protest conditions, the circumstances in which the police can impose conditions, arguably could be tightened. The trigger test is whether or not the noise of a demonstration would cause a relevant impact. Uh, now, relevant impact is defined as causing intimidation, serious alarm, distress. Those are perfectly reasonable. But I think there ought probably to be some safeguards in connection with the types of conditions that the police can impose. And I would like to see some tightening of those definitions. Now, I, I can't pretend at this stage to have done any detailed thinking on this, but that is what the committee stage is for, Chris. It's for looking at this in detail, hammering it out, and, and arguing for a slightly different approach. But the fundamental approach is this. The government has seen London grind to a halt for days on end by forms of static and moving protests that it is unable to impose reasonable conditions on. And I think disproportionate protest, that is to say protest that starts to have a significant impact, disruptive effect for days on end, it is legitimate and it's a legitimate interest of society to seek to limit. That isn't to undermine protest. It is to keep the right of protest, but to impose upon it reasonable limits in the interests of other people's rights. There is a legitimate argument to be made as to whether peaceful protest can properly have a deep impact upon the running of a, of a major capital city of that kind. Now, I'm not saying that all protest needs to be limited and tamed, and I fully understand uh, why inconvenience in a protest may be part of the political point. But I think there comes, and this is what the bill is trying to achieve, a point where that balance tips and where the disruption and impact caused to people going about their daily business is a legitimate interest to protect. And that's what this bill seeks to do. And I don't think that it can be characterised in the hysterical way the left have tried to, to, to stereotype it, which is a, some sort of attack on democracy. Won't this make it just much harder to police? I mean, much harder to know where the line is. We saw the difficulties they had with the Sarah Everard vigil on Clapham Common. 
Well, no amount of legislative provisions can replace good judgment in the way a demonstration or an event unfolding is policed. I'm not saying there was bad judgment in the Sarah Everard vigil case, because I don't know all of the facts, but no legislation can prevent uh, or ultimately remove the need for individual discretion and good judgment. But what I would say is that the police have asked for these powers, or at least they've asked for these powers to be reviewed, because the last time in the Public Order Act 1986 was when police powers were reviewed. And what they found is that they don't have the powers to deal with the cleverly evolving tactics of protesters who have free-ranging protests divided up into multiple protests and the existing powers simply aren't adjusted to the tactics of protesters at the moment. Now, you know, I, I think that's a legitimate thing. The police have asked, the government's responded. It had a consultation. The consultation was widely taken up by many people and this is the outcome. So there's no lack of democracy in the way this has been done. And I repeat, it's not unimprovable. But what I have found in the reaction is a degree of hysteria, largely based on not reading it, which I think is completely unnecessary. It's not just the left, though, is it? It's also you know, Sir Charles Walker, senior Tory MP, he's concerned about it too. There's an issue of right to protest, which goes to the very heart of being British, isn't it? And that's what you need to tackle. Absolutely. No, I mean, I mean, I have in the past as a young barrister, I have defended those who've been exercising their right to protest. And I am fiercely supportive of the right to protest. What I'm not supportive of is the use of the right to protest to bring to a halt the ordinary daily lives of tens of thousands of people who want to go about their business for unreasonable, disproportionate periods of time, closing roads for days on end, static encampments which are um, causing daily inconvenience to people going about their business. Now, these kinds of things, legitimate for a period, but there will come a time, I think, when the balance tips. Now, that is what the bill is trying to achieve. And I'm not saying that it achieves that balance now. So I agree with some of my colleagues that in committee stage, we need to look at it. But what I'm responding to, Chris, and what I do find depressing is this, frankly, I think, ill-conceived and exaggerated opposition, which I think is for political purposes. Well, Sir Geoffrey Cox, former Attorney General, thank you so much for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Now, just like any other relationship breakdown, no matter how amicable you try and make it, there will be times when you can't help but snipe at each other. And that's certainly the case with the EU and the UK, whose row about the AstraZeneca vaccine rumbled on this week. So who better to explain what's going on than Stephanie Bolton, Develt's London editor. Stephanie Bolton, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Hello, thanks for having me. Great to have you on. One question. Why does the European Union seem so unsure about rolling out these vaccines, but wants to stop Britain from importing vaccines from European Union factories? Oh, that's a very controversial question, I think. And I think it's a, it's a bit more complicated. It's a bit contradictory as well, because you, you look at Germany and other countries, of course, AstraZeneca rollout was stopped last week because of concerns by agencies that it uh, was not safe enough and that also there are quite a, some millions of doses not being used of AstraZeneca, for example, back in Germany. Now, you might say, why does then the European Commission is about to wage a kind of, as you call it in Britain, a war, an export ban on vaccines coming to the UK? And I mean, that's a very fair question. This is really important to say. If you think that Ursula von der Leyen and what she is saying or how she's blaming Britain is in any way reflected in Germany, it's not the case, really. I haven't seen any headline that is saying something like, 
oh, we need to take vaccines away from the Brits. The Brits are playing a foul game or something. What the European Commission is doing currently, and I, I, I in a way think maybe after all, it's not such a bad situation we are in because they are raising the pressure on AstraZeneca. And it is a very complex situation. But the fact is that since the 1st of February, there is this export transparency register in place that the European Commission launched in a, in a legislation. So since then, there have been 10 million doses of vaccines being exported from the EU to the UK. There has been none so far, as well, there has not been proven any doses being exported from the UK to the EU. Now, from the European perspective, you can say, why can the UK expect the Europeans to send them BioNTech vaccines and they're having a great rollout and good on them and the NHS is, is doing a fantastic job. But why in return do the Europeans not get anything back from the UK? I mean, I ask you that, Chris. Is that fair? Is that fair? Isn't that a contractual issue? Isn't it the case that these contracts were signed before the European Union? So in contract law, the UK should get these, these vaccines first. That's a tricky question. I mean, this is this is the very <laughs> the very core of the question. Who said what in which contract? And as I understand, the contracts do not differ too much. There is in fact a first come, first serve clause in the British contract. But apart from that, it's the best effort clause that's in both. And in both contracts are volumes of doses that uh, both parties have ordered. Yeah. And AstraZeneca has fulfilled far more with the UK than with the EU. But the thing is, there's no way that AstraZeneca would want to, to annoy the European Union for no reason. There must be there must be this contractual heart at the problem. Look, that's that's the very point. Why do they not give an answer to that? I mean, I, I, I was the one who did an, an interview with Pascal Sorio, the CEO, back in February, and he did not answer that question. And times and again, everybody is asking AstraZeneca to be, to be transparent about it, and they are not. And I think what's happening now is that both sides, um, I'm, I mean, we know that your prime minister, Boris Johnson, has been very much on the phone talking to leaders in Europe. And that actually the Telegraph today, your, your colleague, James Crisp, is running a story that they might be agree on a dose sharing deal to, to save face. So I do think that Boris Johnson understands very much the dependency of the UK, of production, of supplies coming from Europe. So it's not good for either side to now um, actually escalate this confrontation even more. They, they really, really need to find a compromise. Now, on Twitter last week, uh, Stephanie Bolson, you said there that a year ago you thought about leaving the UK for Germany because of COVID-19. Not anymore. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I wrote a piece for my paper and it's actually in your paper today as well in the, in the feature section. We have a very nice double page on people just taking uh, stock of this extraordinary year we've all been through. And a year ago, I, I remember very strongly the days here in London and how, how scared I actually was. And knowing that the British health system, while it's brilliant in some things, but that it would be overwhelmed. And by the time my editors back in Berlin said, um, of course, if you feel scared, you, you can come back to Germany any time. And I, I considered that. And now a year later, I've had the vaccine. It looks like very slowly we are here in Britain coming or going back to life as it was before, at least to an extent. While in Germany, they are now back to lockdown. The vaccine rollout still is very slow. And, and people are so frustrated and angry. And now I'd rather stay here in London, yeah. Do you think that this has damaged, that the, the approach to the COVID-19 crisis damaged the unity of the European Union or, or, or the confidence that, that a big trading bloc can work? Because, of course, what Brexit suggests is that it's the nation state that matters. I'll have to think about that one. I mean, I did a very, very interesting interview some months ago with Kate Bingham, this amazing woman who was, the, who was leading the UK vaccine task force. And she time and again said the success of Britain had nothing to do, or at least of the vaccine machinery, so to say, had nothing to do with, with Brexit. And this was a cross-national effort. There were so many scientists involved. Now, you can ask the question, if Britain had still been in the European Union, would the responsibility for the vaccine program really been given to the European Commission? 
That's a very interesting question. And if you look at the facts, the fact is that the German government and the Dutch government already back in June had their own contracts done with AstraZeneca and BioNTech and other companies. And then it was given to the European Commission and they did not a good job. That's that's for sure. Now, why the rollout in Germany is so slow, that has different reasons, has nothing to do with the European Union. It's lack of digital um, uh, tools in, in the health system. It has to do with the federal system. It has to do with far too bureaucratic things. It has to do with data protection, but nothing with the European Union. So if the UK had been part of the EU, then it may be that there would be more, more power for the nation states to try and find the right vaccine rather than to pursue this this across the board approach. I'm pretty sure if, the, if there would have been a British prime minister at the table of the 28, he would have said, no, 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 we, we're not allowing this to be done by, by the commission. We, we should have this maybe outsourced as, as it was done in, in Britain. And I completely agree. It was done so much better in your country than in mine. Well, Stephanie Bolson, the London editor from Default, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Charles Politics. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what do you think? Is Stephanie right? If the UK had been a member of the European Union, perhaps Britain may have persuaded Brussels not to take control of the vaccine rollout plan. I'd love to know your thoughts. Please email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet us, we're at chopperspodcast on Twitter. And while you're at it, why not leave Chopper's Politics a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts? We really do appreciate your kind words and it helps other people find this programme. Thank you once again to my guests this week, David Mundell, Sir Geoffrey Cox and Stephanie Bolzen. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampett and Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. We're trying to learn a little bit more about what you like about our podcast and how we can improve them. So if you have a spare five minutes, please do fill in our survey. The link to it is in the show notes. And by taking part, you could win one of three £100 John Lewis vouchers. What's not to love? And as if we don't spoil you enough already, please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get your first month's subscription to The Telegraph completely free of charge. This podcast is never knowingly undersold. And of course, please to buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph if you can. Until next time, though, cheerio!